Are you aware of how you gain the wonder that you now carry for capitalism, uh, the things that contributed to it? So the question is, how is it that I kind of walk around with a, a sense of um, being mystified at the creations all around us? And um, uh, so I don't really understand why everybody isn't, except that I would say that reading history, um, real history, not the history of kings and dukes and barons and royal marriages and all that other nonsense that people didn't teach in history, but the history of how people lived, the history of what's called private life. I have this beautiful five-farm set in my house I've been reading off and on for as long as I can remember called The History of Private Life. It was first published in French and then in English. The history of how people lived, uh, what, how the, what their eating, eating utensils were like, whether or not uh, people thought it was, whether they had access to bread, how they ate the bread, did they ate with a fork? When was the fork invented anyway? What was the diet like of the average peasant in the 12th century? Uh, we know not that much, really. Historians don't know that much. We know enough to discover something unbelievable, namely that throughout the whole swath of, of human history, uh, hu the human experience has been dominated primarily by grueling, horrible misery until very recently. And speech, there's a wonderful speech, actually, by Ludwig von Mises called Liberty and Property, where he marches through this. He's delivering this at the Mount Pelerin Society. And he's frustrated because he gets some sense that the people at the Mount Pelerin Society, at least in those years, this is mid 1950s, have forgotten what it is that they are defending, what they're for, or what they're um, about, what they believe in. And sure enough, so, he, so he's in a position to try to remind them of the big picture of why it is we believe in freedom and why it's important. So he begins with a historical narrative whole of human history, long, long path of misery, struggling, living not much better than the animals, and unable to support ourselves, uh, unable to uh, uh, populate the world because the food is running out all the time. Or there's a Malthusian trap constantly at work. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't sustain ourselves. And it wasn't until the invention, as he says in this beautiful speech of capitalism, that we began to see this happening. Capitalism uh, began probably before 18... 30, which is where we began to see the gigantic uh, demographic changes. But um, nonetheless, the point is that um, something decisive happened in history, and I think it's marvelous. And if you look at the demographic data going from the beginning of human history up until the present time, you, if you've never seen it, look at the chart, you'll be just absolutely amazed. We are living amidst a miracle. Uh, and, and every retail shop, um, is amazing. And I, I got to tell you something else. I find it particularly amazing that this stuff can perpetuate itself and, and live and thrive even with all the violent attacks on capitalism that go on day and that are built into the law. It's like this whole structure of the state is trying to prevent free enterprise from progressing. It's trying to stop the future from happening. That's the essence of regulation. That's the essence of taxation. The essence of everything the state does is trying to like freeze us in, in time, which we've seen many examples in history when this actually happens. So the state gets big enough, what happens to society? It falls into a static state. Um, Soviet Union is a good case. Uh, Cuba is, is a wonderful, uh, uh, it's not wonderful, it's a terrible case in point about how human society just just stopping. That's the, that's the effect of the state. It's the main effect of the state. Why? Because the state is essentially destructive. So it's destroying new wealth, it's destroying opportunity, it's destroying ideas all the time, or the realization of ideas in, in, in uh, the real world. So, of course, human progress is just going to, is going to stop. That's the effect. Even in the name of progress, the state is stopping progress, like it was doing 100 years ago. So, I find it all the more amazing that we're living in what is, in fact, a beautiful age of digital entrepreneurship. Um, the digital age is one of the most spectacular, well, it's the most spectacular moment in the history of the world. And you and I are living right in it. And we're crazy not to notice and celebrate it and call it beautiful because I don't know what else is in, what, what's more beautiful in this world than a human flourishing. That's the most beautiful thing there is in all of its multifarious forms, whether it's art or ballet or music, or philanthropy, um, corporate finance, um, you know, industry, everything. It's, commerce is the heartbeat of life itself. 
And who beats that heart? Who's causing that heart to beat? It ain't the state. That heart beats within all of us and, 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 and coordinates uh, together, all of us, that heart. And um, um, it's a beautiful thing. So I find myself, yes, enraptured, as was Bastia, and, uh, and as was Mises, I think. Uh, we have to notice it, because otherwise we have a propensity to, to take it for granted. It takes people like us to notice it, to point it out to others. And just, you know, I used to be shy, actually, as a writer. I used to be shy to try to kind of contain uh, myself so I could be kind of like other people. You know, like, oh, I didn't want to so much deviate from the pattern within our world. At some point in, in the course of my writing, I decided I would hack with it. I love all this stuff. and I'm just going to say what I think. I'm just going to, I'm going to share the love. And that's, that's pretty much what I like to do. I love to do it. And I no longer hold back. That's the essence of it. What's the best and most practical ways to advance liberty? I wish I knew. I think everybody has a different calling. And there has to be some entrepreneurship embedded in with the advance of liberty. Just don't do what you see other people doing. All right? so if somebody else is doing it, maybe you don't need to do it. We should all be trying to find that thing within us that's unique and special and do that special thing. So I'm not going to give any marching orders because, um, you know, it might be up to you to find the thing that nobody else has tried yet. Um, always remember the future is full of opportunity and, and unknowns, and you could change history by finding the, the new thing to do. No reason to strive to be a replication of what's already happened. Yes, you can learn from others, and that's what we should. We have to find stories of success. But you must always improve them. It's the essence, essence of entrepreneurship to adopt what works, but then say, well, I don't want to do just exactly the same thing. We have to take some working thing, understand why it worked, and find a way to make it better. It's true for entrepreneurship and, and the liberty movement, if you want to call it that. What should we call ourselves? I like, um, I'm glad to call myself anything. Um, I'll call myself a lampshade or a banana or, you know, and I, I don't care what I call myself politically. If it causes me to, people to listen to what I have to say, what matters is the, is the substance of the arguments. And sometimes, sometimes, calling yourself a libertarian can be a problem because, oh, you're one of those crazy guys? And they've, they think they already know what you're going to say, so they've already characterized you, and they're not interested in what you're saying. So you've colored your ability to influence them for the, in the future. Sometimes calling yourself an, a libertarian might cause a person to say, oh, well, now that's fascinating. Uh, can you tell me more about that? So I don't think there's any a priori answer to this. What should we call ourselves? I prefer the term liberal because I, I love the heritage of liberalism. I think it's a, a, a valuable heritage. I think it's a, a wonderful tradition and it's something we should embrace. You know, I love the liberal tradition. I've never had a problem calling myself that. Sometimes I just call myself an anarchist and see what happens. Other times you, know, you don't have to call yourself anything. Just speak on the issues as they come up. What is the point of words? The point of words is to communicate. If words we're using have, um, are somehow limiting our ability to communicate, that's a problem. Okay, um, so we need to find the right words so that we can communicate better. What have you found is the best analogy or illustration that gets people to either start learning free market economics or abandon a non-Austrian? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to just change that question and say what's the best way to help people understand the merit of liberty? And I would say if you can get people to reflect on their own lives enough, how they really actually live life from, well, every minute of the day, uh, uh, how they manage their own lives, it's always within the context of, 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 of liberty. Uh, we're drawing on and using the creations of private enterprise at every portion of our day, without which <clears throat> we'd be absolutely sunk. Um, we all swim and live in this world of private enterprise, of, of the products of the miracles of, of, of freedom. <clears throat> and yet, you know, everybody on the planet is asking for the state to do this, state to the state doesn't do anything. The state is useless. I mean, it does destructive things or useless things and nothing else. And I think the best way to realize that, to, to, to come to see that, is by reflecting on the course of your day. On, on, on the sweep of your life. Uh, when has the state ever done anything for you? I mean, people might name one incident, a little something, but it's not daily life. It's the exception. It's a very rare and surprising one. That's why you probably remember it. 
we're so much living amidst the blessings of capitalism that we tend to take them for granted. We just like treat it like breathing. Oh, I want to go get something to eat. I'm just going to get something to eat. <clears throat> and you go, there's my grocery store, there's my Walmart, you know, I've got to get some new clothes. Oh, socks are on sale over at Kmart for a buck a piece. You know, this is, this is just the way we live. It's a matter of trying to get people to connect um, the, the world they live in with the reality that, that everything beautiful in life has been provided for them by some kind of capitalist activity. And linking up that cause and effect and coming to change one's appreciation for the things that are making our life better. I would say that's the best way. And I don't rule out anybody. There's a question in here somewhere that, well, there's some people who are just, you just got to write off. Well, yeah, there are. I mean, I've met, I've met people like this before that are so fanatically attached to some sort of crazy socialist theory. They're not interested in listening. They're not interested in learning. The yeah, best thing to do is just walk away and let it go. But um, generally, you can assume that anybody, no matter their political persuasion, no matter the demographic or age or anything else, you can assume that anybody is, can be ruled out as a possible, how do you say, you know, person that can be convinced of liberty. Um, and you shouldn't be shy about this. You know, there was at some point in my life when I realized, well, look, um, if liberty is true, if libertarianism is true, if anarchism is true, then I shouldn't be shy about taking on any comers. Any questions, make them as hard as you want. Maybe I won't be able to provide an instant answer, but it gives me a chance to think through things and refine my own thinking on stuff. Um, we should really be fearless. Uh, we shouldn't be defensive or recoil when somebody criticizes our position or takes a different position. If you're right, uh, you have nothing to fear from argument, from confrontation, from reading, from vast exposure to anyone and everything. Uh, there's no reason to form yourself up into a tiny tribe and, and put up the walls, you know, and protect yourself from being poisoned by heresy or whatever the thing is. No, I mean, a true defender of liberty should be absolutely fearless and, and totally confident. And if you're not, that's okay. I mean, it just means you need to read a little bit more, uh, think a little bit more, contemplate, look around the world a little bit more. And I think um, somebody who's really curious and really exposed to a broad range of ideas will eventually uh, come around to the anarchist position because the anarchist position is the, is the one that embraces the natural order. It embraces humanitarianism. It embraces human rights and human flourishing. And anything else is just violence.